If you're a Pokemon fan, you'll know how much Game Freak loves to pander to Gen 1ers. Especially since Gen 6, with Megas, Alolan variants, and many of her smaller features favouring Gen 1 Pokemon. So it should come as no surprise that as soon as the Switch became a success story for Nintendo, Game Freak jumped at the chance to pander to Gen 1 fans, with another Gen 1 remake. I'm of course talking about the Let's Go games, and if you're the vigilant type, you'll notice the title is actually a reference to Pokemon Go, the mobile game. That's because Game Freak had the admittedly smart idea to pander to the most casual players around, the Pokemon Go crowd. I have a special kind of resentment for Pokemon Go, but that's a whole kind of worms I'll save for another day. But it's needless to say with my hatred of Gen 1, mixed with my hatred for the dumbing down of the main series games, I wasn't looking forward to Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Now having played it for myself, I can truly say my suspicions for the game weren't misguided. Getting the positives out of the way, the game does look and sound fairly good. In terms of presentation, I think this game is going to hold up fairly well in the years to come. The art style is fairly inoffensive and is a decent fit for the Pokemon franchise. The music is probably as good as Gen 1 music can get. I'm sick to death of hearing these tracks, but I'm willing to admit these iterations are well made. There are also a bunch of nice quality of life changes, some of which are carryovers from previous games like mountable Pokemon and being able to use special abilities in the place of HMs. But that's where the major praise stops. While this game is quite inoffensive as a whole, even looking at some of the choices made here from a casual player's perspective, they leave you scratching your head. Take the catching mechanics for instance, obviously based off of its predecessor of sorts, the catching mechanics require you to swing your Joy-Con to catch a Pokemon, and it's wonky as hell. It can be very strange and awkward to catch a Pokemon at times, however it could have something to do with the placement of my TV or console, but even without the troubles I face trying to catch these critters, the system isn't really fun or rewarding in any way. And what makes it worse is the fact that you don't really battle these Pokemon, you just occasionally throw berries at them to make them easier to catch, and then swing your arm at the screen like a moron to catch the fucker. You do still get EXP for catching them though which is cool, but that ends up creating another problem in the form of grinding and progression. The Kanto games have never been the most grindy games in the world, you can basically play them on autopilot for the most part and run into very few speed bumps. But here any and all challenge comes from whether or not you want to conform to playing the game how the developers want you to play it, i.e. catching every Pokemon you see so you're not far behind in terms of strength. Because if you do what I did and put your foot down about it and just try to level up with trainers and the occasional Pokemon here and there, you're gonna have a bad time. Since in the early game, it's quite hard to level up on just trainers alone and reach the level requirements for the gyms. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, you have certain requirements if you even want to enter the gyms in these games. Usually it's reaching a certain level, but occasionally you'll get a dumb one like requiring a cute Pokemon in your party or having to catch 50 different species of Pokemon. While in theory this idea seems okay, in practice it's annoying as hell and slows the game down, especially if you're not the catch em all type of player. I know this seems like a nitpick because realistically it could be mitigated by just following the former slogan of the franchise, but when you realise the Pokemon franchise is built off of freedom to play however you want, it becomes a problem. Being a part of the Pokemon fandom, you realise how many different ways they are to enjoy the games. You meet shiny hunters, competitive players, the straightforward beat the story type of players, and yes, even the catch em all type of players. And having this game centred around the admittedly dated tagline of the series bogs down the experience because you do genuinely have players who just want to catch the Pokemon they want to use in that particular game and then continue with the story, but they can't do that because instead of battling wild Pokemon, they have to sit around and feed it berries so they can catch it successfully. Again, I understand this may sound a little nitpicky to a degree, but I really think it can ruin the experience for some. I know it did for me and that's hard to do because I already hate Kanto enough as it is. But moving on from my grievances with the mechanics, I'm sure all of you are curious if there are any features or inclusions that I do like. Well apart from the presentation and quality of life improvements, there isn't much since it's the same song and dance from 20 plus years ago with a few new characters. The main ones, obviously, being the new protagonists Chase and Elaine, who are blank slates like every other protagonist so they're relatively inoffensive. What is offensive however is your rival, Trace. I've said in the past how I don't mind friendly rivals too much, as long as they're done well like Cheren and Bianca or main Brendan. But this is yet another example of a friendly rival done wrong. He's extremely hollow and boring, arguably even more so than those fuckers from Kalos. Much like the past friendly rivals, they do try to throw him a bone and give him some kind of development, 
but it falls flat for me personally. I would have much preferred Blue's arrival, even though he's not the greatest or my favourite, although I do understand this is Chase and Elaine's story, not Red's, so it wouldn't have made much sense keeping the same rival. Speaking of which, Blue, Red and even Green from the manga in these games, which is a really cool touch and a nice bit of fan service, especially with Blue serving as somewhat of a mentor for both the player and Trace. The fan service doesn't stop there though, as Jesse and James from the anime make a return, since these games are technically Pokemon Yellow remakes, and they're pretty faithful to their anime incarnations, which is pretty cool. And on top of that, we get a glimpse into the future of Team Rocket, with the inclusion of Archer, the future Team Rocket executive, who eventually takes over for Giovanni in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, which was an inclusion I was very happy to see. Now, the fan service alone wasn't enough to make me like this game, nor was the inclusion of features such as overworld encounters in place of wild encounters or Pokemon following you around. But I'm willing to admit there are things to like about this game but I can't recommend it in good conscience, especially since Fire Red and Leaf Green are a thing. The catching mechanic alone just destroys a lot of the appeal of Kanto in favour of a more casual experience. And the thing is, I didn't even have time to go over all my minor grievances with the game, but honestly, I don't think it's worth my time. I've said all I need to say. Unless you're a diehard Kanto fan, or someone who just really wants to play every main series entry, I could safely recommend you skip this entry because past the shiny new coat of paint and new features, this is arguably the worst iteration of Gen 1 to date. 